Greetings and uh, welcome to Veterans Remember. I'm Dick Gooding and I'll be your host for this series, uh, which has just recently begun and we'll go through the uh, fall and into the winter. Uh, what we're doing is, uh, under the auspices of HCAM, uh, we're interviewing and having discussions with veterans here from uh, local veterans from Hopkinton and uh, uh, reliving some of their tales and some of the stories of their experiences uh, primarily during wartime but not exclusively and a little bit about weaving into the stories of the, uh, the, the history of the town of Hopkinton as well. Uh, this series uh, we expect will be uh, really helpful for our young children to learn about uh, uh, the veterans and, and uh, of various wars and uh, we would encourage you if you have uh, anyone that you know of that might be interested in participating in such a, a, an event uh, to, to contact HCAM TV and uh, we'd be happy to uh, meet with them at, at your convenience or at their convenience. Uh, this evening we have uh, Dan Garner uh, joining us and uh, we're very pleased to have Dan. Uh, uh, he's been a longtime resident although uh, not originally from Hopkinton, and uh, no. uh, uh, as a matter of fact, about as far away from Hopkinton as you can get. Dan, yeah. why don't you tell us where, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up out in Nebraska. As a matter of fact, it's such a proud state that they even teach you how to say it and spell it backwards. Exarbon, A-K-S-A-R-B-E-N. <laughs> the only reason for that is the Exarbon racetrack. Oh, but I that's see. one way to fool people on uh, Well, I understand that uh, uh, you joined the Merchant Marine at a very tender young age. Can you tell us about that? Well, I was at the old age of 16, and they said, join the Merchant Marine and be patriotic. So I quit school. I told my mother, I signed those papers. So she signed the papers, and I joined the Merchant Marine. Well, I went in the maritime service, and they sent me out to Catalina Island for training. Out in California? California. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they uh, taught you uh, primarily safety, mm -hmm. lifeboats and uh, swimming, firefighting, and uh, in general. But uh, it was a good of experience for young kids. But it was uh, kind of eye-opening too from getting out of Nebraska and going out there to the seeing the big water. And <laughs> well, I'd like uh, the all of you folks here to take a look at this picture that we have of this young 16-year-old merchant mariner, and uh, this is Dan when he uh, just after he joined the Merchant Marine. Now, Dan, the, the Merchant Marine. Uh, I, I had done a little uh, uh, research on it when uh, when I knew that you were part of it, uh, but and I was surprised to find that uh, the Merchant Marine really uh, carried a heavy burden uh, during World War II, and I found that <coughs> one out of 26 Merchant Mariners were uh, killed in the in the line of duty. Well, during the early part of the war, man, mm -hmm. a lot of it uh, before the war, when the German U-boats were, and before we, the United States got into it, but uh, they, uh, even towards the end of the war, uh, the, the uh, you didn't have the uh, fighting capacity on the, well, you weren't a fighting ship anyway, because you had a crew of 47 men or less, and that was including the 13 men on the armed guard. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you were going to be in a uh, combat zone, well then they would put 26 men on for the armed guard. But that was uh, to man uh, eight 20 millimeter mm -hmm. cannons, and then a three inch cannon on the bow, and then they had some sort of a contraption on the Stern is usually a five inch, but I was on one ship and they test fired, fired the five inch, 
it had damn near sunk the ship. <laughs> because the ship was an old ship, and uh, oh, it was a rust bucket. <laughs> It loosened up all the rust. <laughs> now, how big a ship were you? Uh, were you on the same ship during the, your entire uh, experience in the Merchant Marine? Uh, no. I started on the S.O. S, S Bayonne in San Pedro, mm -hmm. California, and then ended up on the East Coast before the E Day. And then I went back to the West Coast, and I got on the old. Uh, Excuse the expression, the leak and beacon. The leak and beacon. <laughs> and, well, it belonged to the Beacon Oil Company out of Boston. I see. But it was uh, under charter to Standard Oil. Mm -hmm. And um, made it run up to Canada and then uh, out to Hawaii. And then we were on our way to Medway Island. And then they pulled us back to Hawaii. and sent us down to Panama and we were going to go back to the States but they changed their orders, loaded full cargo and went towards Medway Island again. Hmm. So did you, make, did you make uh, numerous trips with uh, oil that, we, that you delivered to? Oh yeah. Yeah? And, and how many trips? A dozen? Three or four? Or? Oh, uh, well, sometimes on those trips you can handle three or four different cargoes. I see. Uh, you know, load up uh, in Venezuela, load up down in Panama, load up in Hawaii, uh, load up in California, or wherever, and you'd uh, pick up cargo wherever. Now this was in uh, 44 and 45? Mm-hmm. And uh, what were the seas like over in uh, the Pacific? Were they, uh, 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 they didn't have the same U-boat uh, fleet that the Germans no, did in the, in the North Atlantic, but, no. but they still had U-boats and... Well, it wasn't near the hostility. Uh, well, the ships we were on, <laughs> they were too slow. They kept us away and let the Navy go in closer. Yeah. Now, but, did the uh, Navy escort you uh, uh, as you were convoying across the No, the most water? of the time they found out in the Pacific it was better to go individual. That way the ships could go ahead full power. Where in the North Atlantic, when they were in convoy, some of those ships were only traveling at seven, eight knots. Yeah. But they had such a group that they couldn't uh, break and run. Well, I, I was reading that in 1942 there were like 1,200 ships that were sunk in the North Atlantic alone, and some 3,000 in all. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I guess the Pacific wasn't nearly as bad, although I'm sure a lot of ships uh, were lost at sea. Well, actually, I think uh, your North Atlantic was probably a, the worst of the, uh, for the Merchant Marine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no question of that. Uh, especially the boys that went up there and Mermance and Archangel and all. Yeah. So on VE Day, which was uh, uh, in May of uh, 45, is, it, mm. is that right? Yeah, I was in, uh, on my way to Hawaii. You were on your way to Hawaii because you'd gone from the West Coast to the East Coast and then back, uh, yeah. back again. Yeah, and then uh, we... Uh, well, made the trip out there, and then uh, just on that when we were headed back to uh, Medway Island, VJ Day came. Is so that right? That canceled that trip. Well. So never make anybody any further than Hawaii yeah. in the Pacific. Yeah. Now, did you ever run into any uh, U-boats or mm, any no. kamikazes or anything? How, how about mines? The only thing, one time during the daytime, we spotted a mine, and they were trying to shoot it, and they couldn't explode it, and thank God the Navy destroyer came along, or DE, and they said, go ahead, we'll take care of it, and they did. So even though the we, merchant we, mariners had guns, they weren't they, they weren't the gang we that could shoot straight. We weren't the proficient ones. <laughs> well, that's that's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, what other uh, interesting stories might you share with us about 
some of your trips on the on uh, you know on the on the boats and the merchant marine. I would say uh, you were never know where you were headed. Uh, well, when you would sign on, you would sign on for a, a trip or two years, and uh, on foreign articles, mm -hmm. and uh, that would uh, well you'd be out for eight months and. Uh, you be down in South America or over in Europe and Mediterranean. Or now, were most of your uh, most of your cargo uh, oil or we well, I'm strictly tankers? Strictly tankers. So it was mm. all always oil mm. or, or gas too. No, no. Uh, I didn't have handle. It. Well, we did have one tank that they had some gas on, but. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, uh, that was a special cargo. I see. And we and, and you, you mentioned that uh, you were you were working for, like for Standard Oil. Were they the ones that were primarily commissioned to handle those chores? Oh, well, uh, we were under contract to the government. Yeah. But then again, too, I knew some of the men that were talking about they were working for Standard Oil, and they were picking up oil down in Aruba diesel fuel uh -huh. and they were going over to the Azores pumping diesel fuel off German U-boats on the other side taking on diesel fuel and then U-boats saying we don't, don't worry we know where you are <laughs> we know where you are <laughs> so uh, big companies well I think uh, uh, one of the most important things that uh, that I've learned uh, in, in conversation both with you and then doing a little research was the active role the Merchant Marine played uh, during the war and, and I guess during all wars. Uh, a couple of friends of mine from Woodville, the Harris Boys, you know the Harris Boys, Freddie oh, yeah. Fred Fred and Albert, Albert oh, yeah. Harris, uh, were in the Merchant Marine right out of uh, uh, Maine Maritime. They both went up to school in Maine Maritime. and. Uh, they were active during the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, which, again, uh, they weren't worried too much about U-boats, but it's still a pretty dangerous yeah. occupation. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 being in Vietnam myself, I was very pleased that they were doing so well as merchant mariners and playing such an important role. Well, most of your uh, merchant officers were Naval Reserve. Right. right. I, I won't say they were all. Yeah. But most of them were Naval Reserve, and the well, Navy said, "Hey, we need you more over there <laughs> than we need well, you I know here." Uh, Fred went from uh, uh, the Merchant Marine into working for uh, General Dynamics down at Electric Boat, oh, and yeah. is now uh, now in charge of a whole shipyard out in San Diego, and mm. the number three or four man at General Dynamics. So he's done well mm. being in the Merchant Marine. Oh yeah. Oh. So tell us about uh, your return to Hopkinton. Uh, how, how did you wind up in Hopkinton from Nebraska? Well, I was uh, on board ship and I had a vacation. And who wants to go to Nebraska in the month of February? <laughs> so I went up to... I'm not sure who wants to go to Hopkinton in the month of February. But <laughs> well, that was before I even knew the town of Hopkinton. <laughs> but uh, I went up to North Conway, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And one girl I met up there, I couldn't kiss, and I'll be a son of a gun. I ended up marrying her. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it only lasted for 57 years. For 57 years, huh? And she was from Hopkinton? No, she was from uh, Newton. Okay. And uh, well, when we moved out here, she thought we were moving out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but in the 50s, there wasn't even a traffic light here in town. That's right. That's right. It was in the late '50s when the uh, first light went up there at uh, Katz's Drugstore. Mm. Yeah. All right. So, so how did you wind up in in Hopkinton? Well, I was working on the mass pipe. Well, when I, she said either come home and stay home, or don't bother come home at all. <laughs> so I happened to go to work on the mass pipe. I see. And. Uh, the rent down in Newton, the guy raised our rent up to $85 a month. <laughs> and I said, that's just too darn much. So I found, saw this old farmhouse out here in Hopkinton. 
and it was seventy-five dollars a month. So we bought that from Joe Pine. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. And uh, been there know, over fifty-three years. Now, Not now many of the people in Hopkinton uh, know your name, uh, the Garner uh, name, because of your sons. Tell us a little bit about your sons and the business that they're in. Well, the boys are on the tree business, and uh, they've done what I asked them. Be honest and be fair. Be honest and fair. Well, that's a that's a pretty good treat. <laughs> and uh, as far as I can tell, they have. And uh, matter of fact, one guy called Bruce up. He ordered a quart of wood. And they sent a quart of wood out. And he called him up, and he says, "Hey, I ordered a quart of wood." Bruce says, "What am I short?" The guy said, "No." He says, "I stack it. And I got a quart." Quarter and a quarter. Bruce said, geez, zip, isn't that my fault? <laughs> so, you know, after that, uh, <laughs> he would never. But uh, they always tried to do their best for yeah. whatever. Now, y you and your wife, uh, I understand, did quite a bit of traveling. And, oh. uh, you know, maybe uh, folks would be very interested to hear a little bit about, you know, about your traveling. Well, all you had to do was say to my wife, let's go, and she had the suitcases packed. And the only reason she let me go was somebody had to carry the suitcases. I see. <laughs> but, uh, oh, we've uh, made, well, our youngest son made uh, ten trips down to the Caribbean with us. And that was Antigua and Montego Bay and Jamaica and St. Thomas, Tortola, and boats. But then uh, we started going over to Europe, and then uh, Scandinavia, Russia, Germany, Holland, Belgium. And what were your What were some of your favorite places to go? If I was to go back, to my I would say my favorite place would be Stalheim, Norway. That was probably the prettiest and most pictures spot I'd ever been. Really? How did you pick places like? like uh, Norway to, to go to? Well, you go on these tours and mm -hmm. just happen to be part of that tour. And uh, they wouldn't serve us dinner, or serve us coffee after dinner. You had to go out into the drawing room and have coffee. And they had the grand piano there and he was playing Grieg. And you could hear the uh, waterfalls in the background and all. But if during the daytime you could look out there and you could see 10 or 12 waterfalls are falling anywhere from probably 50 feet to 400 feet, hmm. you're, you're right up there in the fjords yeah. country. But that was probably one of the... And then uh, they had a nice little museum there, but that scared heck out of me because the, they took us through on a tour and this curator, she picked this up, picked that up, and you know, normally they don't pick, pick things up in the right. museums. Then they found out later, her father owned the museum. <laughs> Gee, when you, when you walked into the studio tonight and you reached in your pocket of your jacket and you pulled out a piece of paper and you, you showed it to me, why don't you tell, uh, tell the folks about that? Oh, it has been quite a while since, but my wife and I, we were making a tour on the Danube River and uh, when we were in Vienna we uh, went to a concert and I happened to take a program stuck it in my pocket and tonight when I put the coat on I found the program <laughs> of the <laughs> concert there in uh, Vienna but that was a nice trip there too uh, I went down well, Vienna and then went to Hungary and then into, well, it's not Yugoslavia anymore, but, and then into uh, Romania and Bulgaria. Right. But that made a very nice trip. Uh, we saw the, some of the damage that the U.S. planes did there in Yugoslavia. Oh, really? Oh, they blew the heck out of that one bridge. And then, Oh, now I've 
that's how they got going after Milosevic and right. got him in. But uh, oh, so you were traveling what, the past ten years. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I worked there in uh, Kismayo, Somali, East Africa, and that's where uh, that Black Hawk down. Oh yeah, in Somalia. Well, Kis that's where they was filmed. Was yeah. Kismayo. And you worked there? Yeah. What What were you doing there? Construction. Yeah. And then uh, I worked over there in uh, Buchanan, Liberia, and uh, that's where the Civil War is going. Well, they're still fighting all the. Were you working for a large uh, construction firm? Yeah. What What company was that? I was Raymond International mm -hmm. in uh, Liberia, and Paul Smith out of Orlando, Florida, in uh, Somali. Well, that's fascinating. It takes you to some very yeah. interesting places. I guess that's where you got your your love of traveling, huh? No. No? <laughs> Getting out of Nebraska. <laughs> 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 and seeing uh, how much there is to this world. Wow. That, that's, uh, that's fascinating. It's, it's a wonderful spot, a place, and, well, knock on wood, I've never had a job I didn't enjoy. Well, you're very fortunate. That, that <laughs> sounds like a, like a great, ex uh, great experience, to be Even sure. When I was going to sea, I enjoyed going to sea, and I'm about ready to set for my third mate's license when my wife says, hey, that's enough. That's enough? Yeah. How how long were you in the in the Merchant Marines? About eight years. Eight years. Oh, well, that's that's quite but, a good deal of time. In the Merchant Marine, no, you wear no uniforms. Mm -hmm. There's no saluting. About the only time you know who the captain is, usually when you come into port, he's got the hat with the scrambled eggs with the on. Scrambled eggs on. Usually. The usually. Huh. But uh, other than that, there's no uniforms or anything. How you happen to? dress so long as you're covered and uh, uh, well in the Navy you you couldn't go without a shirt in all a lot of places yeah uh, there you could work without a shirt and all but that was one thing I found out too now over in Abadam Iran with the uh, Arabs they wear those gowns Right. That's a good reason for it. What's that? That way the sun doesn't get on you. Oh, I see. It's to keep the sun off. Because it was 120 and, and, degrees. And, and, and it's cooler underneath. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, I think that, uh, you, you know, your experience in the Merchant Marine is, uh, I found fascinating learning a little bit about, about it. Uh, and you learn a, a new respect for the Merchant Marine as a service. There are some people who don't think uh, that that was a, an armed service, but uh, boy, it sounds huh? like it's every bit as uh, much of an armed service as the U.S. Army that I served in. Well, it took the government quite a while after World War II before they recognized him. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Pat Lynch had to, uh, he had to fight like heck, and he finally got the Merchant Marine flag for the, uh, for the gazebo. gazebo. Oh, is that right? So yeah. you, you were nudging Pat a little bit, were you? No, but... No? Uh, <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, that's fascinating. Again, I, I, in some of the research I, I, I found, I was uh, amazed that uh, in World War II there were 20,000 casualties within the Merchant Marine that's wounded well, and, uh, and, and killed in the line of duty. Well, Standard Oil, I had lost an awful lot of tankers. And, right. And then a lot of their tankers were converted to many aircraft carriers. Oh, to really? Yeah. Jeez. Because they were big. And yeah. They didn't have the superstructure and all like yeah. cargo ships and that. So hmm. all they had to do was just knock out that midship housing and put it to the side. Yeah. They could, now they won't compare with the big one, but uh, there were quite a number of them were made into small carriers. Yeah. Well, Dan, I really thank you for uh, joining us tonight and telling us your fascinating stories, uh, both about Merchant Marines, about your family, and about growing up in Nebraska. Uh, you've added a lot to uh, veterans remember, and uh, uh, again, we're, we're pleased to have the opportunity uh, uh, 
uh, to present this to the community, and uh, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to host it, along with Hank Alessio, my friend, and uh, uh, we're doing our level best to uh, make uh, this available to the community, uh, to all the residents of Hopkinton, and we think it's such an important thing mm. uh, that people remember our veterans and listen to what veterans say and veterans remember. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for joining us tonight and sharing with uh, us your thoughts. Well, it's been my pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much, Dan.